I like the challenge of trying to get a perfect service. You know, we have good services, we have terrible services, we have okay services, but you, you just keep going every night in search of this perfect service. And there are so many things that need to go right for that to happen, that it, it just becomes this um, this, this uh, addiction of chasing this this perfect service, which maybe can never happen, I don't know. This week on Dirty Linen, I am coming to you from lockdown number four. Melbourne and my home state of Victoria are in lockdown, hopefully just until the end of the week. And uh, today we are chatting to Robin Wickens at the Royal Mail Hotel, about four hours west of Melbourne in Dunkeld. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to Robin is because I was supposed to be at the Royal Mail and I'm looking at the website, looking at the Mountain View room that I was supposed to be in, um, just really missing the fact that I am not there because I'm in lockdown. So, Robin, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, Danny. Uh, so, what's it like there? What am I missing out on? Um, well, it's pretty, you know, we were just about to go into our uh, annual holiday. We were closed for the month of June and we didn't even make it to the uh, the end of the, the start of the holiday. So we closed a couple of nights before. Um, obviously, you were supposed to be there in uh, one of those nights. But now it's, um, yeah, now we're, we're into lockdown slash holiday. So we were sort of prepared for this break anyway, but uh, we just got it a little bit early. And um I mean, what's the impact on a country business like yours when you lose those bookings, lose those days of trade? Um, yeah, it's been it's been uh, you know interesting. Um, obviously, this is the fourth lockdown we've had. I think the, the by the by the sort of third one, we were a little bit more prepared uh, with what to expect. And um, as I said, this one. I guess hasn't really affected us because all the staff were, were due to go on annual leave and we really just ended up losing the Saturday night's trade. Um, so I'm assuming it will all be over by July when we're supposed to come back and then we'll just pick up where we left off, I guess. Well, that's pretty lucky, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's It's kind of lucky, although we're supposed to go to Queensland, so not so lucky if uh, if it doesn't open up again. Right, so you'll just have to stick around Victoria? Just stick around Victoria and, uh, yeah, just find somewhere in Victoria we haven't been. Yeah, there's certainly been a lot of sticking around Victoria. Um, I was coming, I was going away for a couple of days on a road trip with a friend and we were going to head over to you for a night and then, yeah, go to Ballarat and drive around, go to Bujbim, the um, Aboriginal uh, fish traps, World Heritage Site, and I was so excited because I mean there is so much to explore in Victoria, um, but uh, not when you're restricted to five k's. Yeah, I mean I think we've and in, in in some ways we've benefited a lot from you know people being stuck to Victoria like we, since we opened. Um, what towards the end of last year we've just been so busy and I, I know most places have but we've just been flat out like every night so it's been it's been good probably a lot of or well, some people that maybe wouldn't have travelled this far into Victoria to come and visit us so it's been um, it's been really nice to see that uh, people are out and exploring the state and getting out to the um, the faraway places places of Victoria Mm. How's it been for um, staff out there? Staff, um, by the sounds of it, we've been pretty, pretty lucky. We kept um, we kept the majority of our staff um, from the from the first lockdown. So we uh, we probably what did we used to have like seventeen, eighteen chefs, and I think we went down to fourteen, um, and we managed to. Uh, keep hold of all of those through lockdown. Uh, some were visa holders. Um, I guess the, the, the way we have the business set up, we're pretty lucky in that we have quite a few company houses and things like that. So we were able to um, let them uh, live rent free and, and take away kind of a little bit of the, the stress, use up some annual leave that people had. 
Um, so we did manage to hold on to to the majority of our staff. We picked up a couple of new staff members when we reopened, um, and I, th I feel like we've been pretty lucky to have that many staff around because I know some people are, are pretty struggling. Yeah, I think that's incredibly lucky. It's so fortunate to have the accommodation. Um, so, Robin, obviously I didn't make it over this time, but tell me what kind of experience you create for your guests at, at the Royal Mail. Um, well, the, we've, uh, with Wiccans at the Royal Mail, we've kind of um, – we, we we feel like the, you're, you're there, so we're gonna we're gonna give you a, a pretty um, luxury experience. You know, you, we, it's not a, it's not a short dining experience, um, and we've tried to create this. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's not yeah, it is fine dining, but I think it's more just like I don't know, uh, like what I what I would like to eat. Like it's pretty grown up. Um, experience a lot of um, composed dishes, whereas some people are sort of go down the road of road of lots of little bits and snacks, and like this is a this is a full menu of all thought about composed dishes um, with with flavour being paramount, and I guess it's just what we've what I've worked to over the years to get to this style of food of of where where. Um, where I've wanted to get the food too. Mm, interesting because, yeah, I've eaten your food in Melbourne at the Deanery and then before that at Interlude, which is probably the restaurant that you became best known for in the city. I mean, how would you describe the way that you've progressed your food? Um, I think it's changed a lot over the years. Like it's, you know, uh, going back to Interlude, it's, you, you're pretty – I was a lot younger, uh, and you, you, you sort of—I felt like I was really out to try and impress. You know, you, you get that idea that you've got to try and show everyone everything that you can do. Um, and just over the years, I think it's sort of um, relaxed, and I've become a lot more comfortable with with the food that we're serving. Like, I really only think I've got to where I want to be as a chef over the last few years. Like, it's. Um, sometimes I think you think you're going to be like this, the best chef you can be at 25, 26, 30 even. But I think it takes a long time to to actually you get comfortable with where you are as a chef and, and serve the food that you want to be without feeling like you have to um, impress everyone or try and win awards or do anything. Like it's just about serving really delicious food that uh, I would like to eat and hopefully people enjoy eating. What's an example of a dish that <laughs> I would have had? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, uh, so we're sort of heading into our first kind of, the first of our sort of autumn menus, I guess, so we're starting to use a lot more of the, um, the early autumn ingredients. So we've got things like scallops and Jerusalem artichoke and acorns. Um, we've got a, we've got, we don't have it anymore, uh, a, a John Dory dish where it's cooked on the bone with spaghetti squash and salsify. So we have the first salsify coming through. Um, and monk's beer, that's a new, uh, vegetable we're growing in the gardens. So that was all on one, one of the fish dishes. Duck, we always have a duck dish on the menu. So great ocean ducks. Um, and the duck dish was with a fruit salad, so kind of like the late summer fruits, lots of grilled watermelon and um, apples and pears. Um, and for dessert, we were doing a green tomato dessert, so using up all the green tomatoes that were left um, in the garden. So that's that's the menu we left with, and we'll, we'll come back with a completely new menu in July. So... You missed out on all those dishes. <laughs> Forever. Okay. Forever. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because as you talk about them, I mean, you really 
you're really leaning into the ingredients. You're not so much talking about techniques and, and the way that those ingredients are prepared. Do you think that that's a big difference in the way that you think about putting dishes together these days? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you always get asked that question of what style your food is and, and what sort of food you cook. And I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that. I think I've noticed over the last few years, like it's really about this intense flavor that I think we've all, you know, I've always been thinking about flavor, but I think you sometimes get lost in techniques and trying to be too clever. Whereas now, because we use the garden so much and we're not limited by the amount of ingredients we use, we can create these dishes that have such an intense flavor, which is probably maybe, I don't know, maybe that's different. Like there is a a school of thought where kind of subtle flavors and um, this natural flavor is uh, a style that people are serving, whereas we've gone the other way. And, you know, if we're going to put something with basil on it, we can use so much basil because we have endless amounts of basil. We're not tied to having to order two or three bunches and we just keep adding basil until it's basil enough. <laughs> I love that. That's great. I mean, yeah, that must be so different from ticking off items on an order sheet to ha- to have the the garden that you can just go out and get armfuls of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, with the chefs, you know, it, we don't necessarily work to recipes. Um, it, it's about the taste, and you, 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 the flavor of ingredients change throughout their whole life, so you can't. If we're going to if we're going to stick to the basil, you can't really have a recipe that has 300 grams of basil at the start of the season. By the end of the season, it will have changed. So you have to teach them to taste things and and just get the flavour right, rather than sticking to a weight or a quantity. So is I mean one of the things that chefs talk about is consistency. I mean, is that are you looking for a different type of consistency or is consistency not a a word that is is that not so important in your kitchen um no i like i like consistency but um you can't uh the ingredients change so much it's very like if you if you stick to a recipe 100 percent, then you, you're not allowing for a for the change in ingredients over the course of their life or, or just through nature you know you can't guarantee that the 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 chicken is going to be the same size every time or the you know when you start thinking about it right down to the smallest ingredient each chicken bone is going to have a different amount of gelatin or the vegetables are going to change flavor and water content throughout their life so you can't be held to this recipe that says you have to add um you know 500 grams of celery to this dish so we try to get the consistency just through tasting through changing the the slightly different um parameters of i guess of making an ingredient or cooking a dish so the chefs know the, the ones that have been with me long enough know that they're sort of held um to this um, where they can change the cooking time in between this and this to get it to the perfect consistent duck every time. So it might mean 30 seconds in the oven longer or, um, you know, slightly different temperature. And we do get a consistent product, but by being able to be more flexible with our recipes and we're constantly tasting everything like the same people taste it. I guess one consistency is I'm there every day from nine o'clock until the end, you know, we're test, tasting everything, checking everything, and that's how we get our consistency. I know that early in your career you worked at some of London's best restaurants, um, including Babendum and Pieta Terre. Can you talk about the way that you learnt to cook and compare it to the way that you're teaching people? Yeah, I mean, I went through... I went through a lot of kitchens. Some were, some I liked, some I didn't like. Some were good, some were bad. I mean, it's diff. You know, things have changed a lot since then. Some and the changes, some uh, all all the changes are for the better. 
um, you know, these were some pretty angry, hard kitchens. And, and I think you, you try and take the best things from each place you've worked at and create what, what you want to be the ideal kitchen to learn in. Um, I don't think trying to teach people through fear and, and just the, the, the idea that if, the, if they do anything wrong, they're going to, um, you know, copper bollocking is, is that's been proven to not necessarily work. And that's gradually, uh, less, you know, use less in kitchens, I think. Um, so, you know, you have to accept that people are going to make mistakes. You have to want them to make mistakes because that's how they learn as long as they don't keep making the same mistake, I guess. Um, and yeah, I guess you just kind of like take, take little bits from here and there and create this, um, uh, nice atmosphere to learn, to work in. And look, I, you know, I, it's taken me a long time to, to get to that stage as well. I haven't, you know, interlude was probably different again. And, and I think you just, as you get older, you get more relaxed in your abilities and um, just, do you say, more experience, yeah? more experience of dealing with people probably than, than actually cooking. Mm. So you came to Australia, was it about 2000? 2000, yeah. yeah. And then interlude was a few, years after that yeah i think um interlude opened in 2003 uh 2003 2004 something like that um and how long was i there for six six years i'm not, I'm not very good on years i don't i'm not very uh sentimental so as soon as something finishes i kind of stop thinking about it <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah so i think interlude was there for like six years yeah. Okay. So yeah, through the noughties, that's and our, that's when I remember it. And they're on um, Brunswick Street, and it was certainly one of the most uh, talked about restaurants in Melbourne at the time. We got a couple of hats in the Good Food Guide. What I mean, <laughs> despite you saying that you're not sentimental and you don't look back, um, what's that? What's how? How if I force you to? What would you? How would you describe and characterize that experience? Um. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty in, uh, interesting. Like I think, I think it um, gave me the confidence that that maybe um, I could run a restaurant. I mean, look, I, like I look back now, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I think the fact that people liked it. Um, gave gave me the, the confidence to sort of um, keep going and, and just gradually keep pushing to get better and change things and and try and sort of refine my idea of what I thought uh, good food was or, or the, f the food I wanted to be cooking. Um, and it was, yeah, there were some interesting moments throughout Interlude. Uh, uh, it certainly got me to think about the industry a lot more and, and um, uh, my, my feelings for the industry changed throughout that time, I guess. Like, did you go off it or what? <laughs> <laughs> I did. There was like, I mean, there, there were some, I mean, there was a big, uh, the whole copycat incident, I guess, was a, was probably the big, uh, defining moment of interlude i guess and that that uh, changed my feelings for the industry it made me fall out of love with the industry quite a lot and ultimately made me a better chef i think mm, that's so interesting i mean i didn't know that we were if we were gonna talk about this but, um, <laughs> so i guess it was the mid mid 2000s um and you were accused of copying dishes from American chefs, it was, I guess there wasn't, so it was um, WD-50 and Alinea, um, New York and Chicago restaurants 
where it looked like your your dishes were um, quite similar to dishes from there. And it was, I guess, it was pre-Instagram, wasn't it? Um, it was pre-Instagram. It was pretty early days of the um, the internet. And um, I, had been to, I had been to America to do uh, stage at Alinea and per se, and I hadn't. I just eaten at WD fifty, and I came back, and uh, play. You know, we, we did we did copy the dishes. I'm not denying it. I made a mistake. I fully admit that. Um, but I think the way it was portrayed was pretty crazy. Like um, I didn't do it with the intention of claiming them as my dishes. I, I honestly, it was just was just playing around in the kitchen, which I thought had no significance in the world. Like we were a tiny restaurant in Brunswick Street in Melbourne. I didn't think people were looking at us. And then it turned into this massive worldwide um, scandal, which, which um, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to, hard to deal with uh, when you... You know, I idolised these chefs. I, I loved the career. I, all I wanted to be was the best chef in this environment of worldwide restaurants. And then to be, you know, this then made this pariah of the industry. It's kind of like, it was, it was an interesting time, pretty dark time. Like, to, you know, like you said, there was no, there was no Twitter. There was no Instagram. Uh, it could have been way worse. We're dealing with like some weird foodie chat room that not many people saw. But look, I mean, I just felt like it could have, like I said, I didn't know what I was doing. I was as a young kid running a restaurant with, a, with, you know, a young family doing those other things. It could have been a better way to handle it. They could have given me a call and said like, hey, this isn't great. But... Um, yeah, it didn't it didn't happen? They, I mean, everyone did well out of it. They they got great publicity out of it. Who got great publicity? Every, everyone, everyone. Not me, apart from me. No. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say. I mean, I guess everyone like, except if for put, me. If you put on the menu WD fifties, whatever it was, then I guess there would have been no issue, right? I mean, I suppose some people could have said, "Oh, why doesn't he create his own dishes?" But I mean, it wasn't. I don't know. It was. I, just, I didn't. It, 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 I didn't even think that much about it at the time. I wasn't doing them regularly. We did them once. We had a. We had, you know, we did them for. A, I don't. I can't even remember how long it was. We had some photos on the website, but certainly when it all happened, they weren't even on the menu. And as far as I was concerned, it was pretty commonplace in the industry. But if someone had told me don't do that, I wouldn't have done it beforehand. Um, and and then you just work through it and. Um, and and it did make me fall out of love with this industry. It was like, man, like that's it was pretty harsh treatment for 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 someone starting out in their career. Um, you know, no one, people I knew in Melbourne, no one contacted me. No one said like, no, one, like just nothing. It was just like I was I was cut out straight away. Um, but, you, but you have, you know, you have to, I couldn't, I didn't have a choice. I had to keep going. I had a restaurant, I had staff, I had a family, I had, I had people relying on me. So you just have to pick yourself up and keep going. And, and as I said, from that, you know, people, I think people forget that Injury was there for a couple of years after that. And I think probably did better food than it ever had. Um, I haven't. I don't look. You know, I haven't looked at cookbooks since. Really, um, I don't really use Instagram. I'm not on social media, um, and I think it's just focused me as a chef better, and maybe not taking it so seriously. Like it certainly changed where where I want to be and what I want to do, what I want to get out of being a chef. In what way? What I mean? What do you want to get out of it? Um, well, I don't take it. I don't take it to. I don't take it as seriously. It's not. Um, I don't know if I have. Well, you sort of realise that it's all. You know, it's all. 
the awards and the, the being the best restaurant is all nonsense. And ultimately, all you want to, all you need to do is serve nice food that people come and eat and enjoy. And that's that's the ultimate goal. Who cares whether you've got two hats, three hats, top fifty? You know, that's all just ego. And once you can learn to cook without ego, your food tastes so much better. Why? Um, because you're putting you're putting more. You're not cooking what you think people want to like or want to eat or what you think other chefs are going to like or what you think the reviewers are going to like. You're cooking food that is delicious. So is that why you're in the country? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I think that's just that's just come about by um, just moving out of Melbourne. Like we went to Apollo Bay first out of restaurants. That was when we had the, the Provador. Um, and then the the job at Dunkeld came up and uh, it was just too good an opportunity to turn down. And so do you see yourself staying there for a long time? Like, do you feel like you've, you've found it or are, you st- are there, are there still unrealized ambitions? No, I think this is, this is exactly where I, um, I want to be. Like it's perfect. It's perfect to me. It's not, it's, it doesn't, it's nice that it is so far out of Melbourne because you do, you don't have to be caught up in the, the, the PR exercise of it all. Um, people just come to Dunkel to come and stay with us. So we, we, there's, there's less pressure to be constantly marketing yourself, which I've never really been interested in. Um, and, is, it, is it everything everything I need is here. So what is it that you like about cooking, Robin? Um, I like the... I like the challenge of uh, trying to get a perfect service, I guess. Um, if you think of it like, I don't know... Um, David Beckham teaching himself to do free kicks. You know, he takes a hundred free kicks a day. Some are good, some go in, some are terrible, but you just keep going and keep practicing. And that's the same thing with our, with our restaurant and with the services. You know, we have good services. We have terrible services. We have okay services, but you, you just keep going every night doing the same thing in search of this, perfect service and there are so many things that need to go right for that to happen that it, it just becomes this um, I don't know this, this uh, addiction of chasing this this perfect service which maybe can never happen I don't know <laughs> Do you ever get to the end and you're like yep oh my god everything went perfectly um, No like not per- like you, we go like that was that was a great service and they can tell when it's a great service. Sometimes we have a terrible service and, or I think we've had a terrible service and the guests love it. So I think we hold ourselves to pretty high, high standards. Um, I, I, w- I don't know what I'd do if we got to the end of it and be like, yeah, that was it. We did it. Perfect. What do we do then? Make it harder and try again. <laughs> um, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a really nice way to, to think, about the for me it, it it's a nice way to think about the industry to to think about the to think about cooking it's just me and people I like working with and um that like working with me they've you know a lot of my chefs have been with me for five years four years you know three years we don't go through a lot of staff which is unusual I think for where we are so it's obviously people that have bought into this idea of um, just purely trying to cook nice food. That That's all it is. Yeah, it sounds pretty simple. Yeah, I think once you take all the other bits out of it, it is. It's only cooking people's dinner at the end of the day. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. So what would you say to a, a chef who's 
really feeling, I don't know, that they want to make something of themselves, that they want to um, do something unique or really expressive, that is feeling that pressure to achieve. Um, what would you say to that person? Um, I would say, you know, why, why, where's, where's the pressure coming from? Like what would, the, the pressure can only be coming from the, you think you have to put 20 amazing photos on Instagram every day or that you have to get three hats or do this. Like if all you want to do is cook food that satisfies you and you think is good, then there, then there is no pressure. And, you, and again, it comes down to taking that ego out of it and just cook what makes you happy. If you, if you, if you putting yourself under that much pressure, then um, maybe you're not doing it for the right reasons, I think. Mm, interesting. Um, so, so we're into the second year of a pandemic that's affected us all in different ways. How do you look back on this whole period and where do you see things going? Um, I do look back on it. I think we've realised that Takeaway boxes are really hard to do. I don't want to do that again. Um, we we tried doing takeaway boxes for a while, and and I think it's really hard. It's way harder than putting it on the on the plates and getting them into the restaurant. So um, we won't be doing that again. Um, I think that we stripped the business down. Um, which was really good. We've got a much more streamlined business. We were doing a lot of things that we maybe just kept doing because we've always done them. Like it's a really interesting um, project to kind of stop a business and then build it back up from scratch again. Like I mean, when like the Royal Mail was pretty um, busy machine like operation seven days breakfast lunch and dinner so to be able to stop that and then bring it back piece by piece you can actually see what works and what doesn't work um so we're not doing things like breakfast at the moment and maybe we won't or we certainly won't go back to doing it in the form that we were doing it um so i think you can if you use this time right you can you can build your business into a more efficient, streamlined business. Um, and yeah, I think just having, having more people within the state visiting has, has made the, the business more consistent. Like we've got, you know, we're pretty much fully booked. Um, right through to, I can't remember when. Well, we, we were fully booked in, in Wiccans up until we closed every every night. So you just come in and you know, right, it's 50 covers, it's 50 covers every night. And you don't have to, yeah, you, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty, well, it's not easy, but it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to plan what we're doing. Um, so if that continues, that'd be great. Yeah, well, Robin, um, I hope that you do get to Palm Cove somehow <laughs> and enjoy a bit of sunshine before you're back to the Dunkeld winter. And I'm definitely rebooking and uh, coming down to see what's growing in the garden and see what I, ends up on my plate. I'm sorry it couldn't happen this time around, but thank you so much for giving me a taste of it all today on the podcast. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.